Hello everyone, today we talk about Leo VI, known also as the Wise, as a general introduction to the Byzantine Emperor's life, and we will come back on his reign also in other videos, hopefully. So, we have also recently made a video about Constantine VII, who was his son, and we have uh, partially addressed the, especially the, the marital issues, uh, say, of Leo VI, uh, regarding especially the, the consequences with his, um, with the Patriarch of Constantinople, ecclesiastical policy, and so on. So, if you want to eventually have a follow up on what, what happened later compared to this video's timeline, uh, you can check that as well as my Byzantine history playlist. Um, uh, we don't know so much about uh, Leo the Sixth's uh, youth, uh, not even origin. We don't even know exactly whose son he really was, and there was some ambiguity in general uh, in the imperial policy regarding that, as um, he may have been both uh, Emperor Michael the um, Third or Basil the First son, right? And we just don't know that Basil the First came power the Macedonian dynasty, after having uh, killed, in fact, Michael III. Uh, and throughout um, his uh, reign, Leo VI would tendentially um, instead take on in, in an anti-Basil function, let's say, that um, Michael's legacy and the fact that he would have been, uh, albeit we don't have it explicitly declared in the sources, Michael's son, right? Um, so today we'll also be brief about this whole thing. Again, uh, the reign is, is somewhat complex and deserves much uh, more in-depth content. Uh, in any case, uh, Leo had fundamentally lived in um, also in Basil the, f the first reign um, with a strange relation with uh, what was considered to be his father, more kind of. Um, uh, more generally, more formally, right? Basil died in 886 after a hunting accident in which he, um, uh, he allegedly claimed to have been uh, killed, in fact, by a plot, uh, albeit the name of Leo is not, uh, is not mentioned on Basil's deathbed. Um, and as a consequence, his son, Leo, uh, succeeded him. Right. Leo VI ruled between 886 and 912. He's also known as Leo the Wise, as he was, as you will see, a man of letters. We made videos, for example, about the Byzantine novel tactics, uh, more or less of this broader uh, early high medieval times, because Leo is, as a matter of fact, also providing with some information about that. As you know, he re... Um, uh, he wrote the Tactica, it was a, a re-visitation, um, you can't say, of the famous Strategicon, uh, to which, in fact, Leo doesn't quite add too much, it's just like his Basilica, his um, juridical work on the base of Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis. As a broader update, right, this is what emerges from um, Leo's work of the current situation in the Byzantine Empire after fundamentally uh, in fact, 400 years, 300, 400 years after uh, the great Justinian end times. This was partially a moment of, as you know, of reconsolidation under the Macedonian dynasty. This was evident uh, in Basil's times, um, as also in Constantine the Seventh times, and in the later ones where, as you know, some of his most famed generals that were conquered much land, especially to the Saracens. Um, would become emperors themselves, so we will look at their stories uh, in other videos, and or you can check for references in the rest of my Byzantine history content. Um, and uh, Leo was this is also the same. He was a pragmatic man in many ways, was a charming figure uh, from others. Uh, he was also a poet, right? He composed. Um, and uh, he had this some this artistic inclination, literary inclination. Most his figure would be in fact mythologized in the Byzantine collective memory, if we can call it this way, um, through the attribution 
of extraordinary powers, hence the wise, etc., and of a series of corpus of prophecies on the destinies of Constantinople. Right. So in many ways, Leo was embodying that at, at the fullest, as you understand, also on his uh, from his literary uh, reworks, this traditionalistic. Um, continuity, right? The, if you want this colorization of the Byzantine model, right, uh, as it had uh, reached its apex in just in end times, and so the continuous affirmation of the monarchic system of the hierarchy, and the Macedonians will try but ultimately fail to contain the power of aristocracy and the fact of the feudalization of the empire. But that was considered as a time, after all some vote of prosperity. As we will see, Leo's reign was actually marked by some important military defeats, but still the splendor of Constantinople was uh, was even in front of the world uh, at the time. As we said, uh, Leo's relation with the father had been difficult, um, exactly because perhaps Leo was in reality um, an illegitimate son of Michael III. Um, and as, in fact, his first acts of government, Leo had uh, the assassinated emperor buried with all the due honors that had been uh, precluded by Basil. He dethroned the patriarch Fotius on November the 29th, 886, um, who was substituted with the 16-year-old Stephen, that was the last-born son of Basil I, and in this sense uh, a pawn at the moment in Leo's hands. Fossius had been an important uh, patriarch, he had, had, as you know, incredible issues with Rome, and the, the thing was uh, going on, uh, but we will see his uh, you know, story in another video. What is important is that um, Leo managed to secure the patriarchal see with um, a man of his control. Um, Leo the, the sixth's foreign policy uh, didn't have much of a you know stable outlook, um, nor a, a coherent trend. Telling the truth, um, there were s some successes in the east especially, in fact, on the easternmost frontier in Anatolia, um, continental um, a border with, with the Arabs, uh, whom, from whom the, uh, the imperial army managed to strip some fortresses that were eventually uh, reinforced and consolidating the, the east flank. Uh, also in Italy, um, as we will see. Um, however, overall there were heavy defeats on other fronts, right, and some uh, of the closest ones, by the way. The military operations waged against the Arabs in the East, there were several, and these are somewhat overlooked in Leo's reign, as we will see in another video, uh, had um, a favorable outcome, right, there were also several ones, um, there was an, an interesting uh, and somewhat um, delicate and precise work carried out by the Byzantine army. Um, and also in southern Italy, where the Byzantine positions were consolidated uh, through uh, temporary occupation of the Longobard Benevent, right, that was the sea of, as you know, the principality that uh, was somewhat a, a buffer state between the empire and, and, uh, and the Carolingians. That, however, was lost again because Benevent was somewhat, you know, these are mountainous interlands and the, the Byzantine troops could not quite um, hold even the main center for for quite a long time and the Longobards eventually managed to retake control uh, of the city. All this was done, by the way, by playing with other Longobard centers in the process, so it was somewhat also, an, an, you know, an internal affair of, of the Longobards as also the answering call of, of the Saracens in the, in the Italian mainland, etc. It's mostly a, a local request in, in mercenary form. Still in southern Italy on the coastal 
frontier, the Byzantine positions were reinforced by uh, an effective action of contrast of the Arab, uh, the Sicilian Arab uh, attempt of uh, settling in Calabria, so crossing the Straits and gaining a foothold in um, what was in fact imperial territory in these um, extremities. Um, in 904, however, the Arabs uh, inflicted uh, a heavy defeat with imposing consequences to Constantinople by seizing uh, Thessalonica. It was the second city and true city, right after on, only true city after Constantinople of the empire, right, um, falling in the hands of Leo of Tripoli's men, right, and Leo was actually a Byzantine renegade uh, at the hand of a, uh, a Saracen privateer's fleet, right, and. Thessalonica was devastated by the winners that left the city with an enormous loot, right? And uh, this, this reflects, generally speaking, what the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean practically was, like, as you know, from um, more than one century, uh, actually a couple of centuries, the uh, Syrian, uh, Lebanese, Palestinian, Egyptian, and also African ones, considering Tripoli, Libyan in this case, um, ports had been captured by the Arabs, right? And what formed there, uh, despite, you know, Islam was still at its peak and the caliphate authority was quite strong, also to, however, some but political fragmentation, especially in between these two uh, major powers, right, the, the empire and the caliphate, with some buffer areas that um, saw the development of a type of piracy that fundamentally included uh, anyone, right? Uh, Leo of Tripoli, uh, as we've seen, was, was a Byzantine, and it was plenty of Christian Saracens, but what we are missing in the equation very often we talk about the Saracens as if you know this is the dark kind of obscurantistic 19th century mythology of the idea that that the Saracens were somewhat uh, a human tide arriving from 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 nowhere and uh, you know overwhelming everything and they were actually and mostly same not even just Mediterraneans but st strictly speaking Europeans most of the time this is especially true in the west um, North Africa didn't never had historically any demographic chance to affect uh, the northern shores of the Mediterranean. The, the, the majority of manpower was dramatically coming from, in fact, uh, populated interlands such as Spain, Italy, um, in, in some cases the same Greece. I mean, yes, there were some pirates and as there were some brigands pretty much everywhere in the world from the within uh, of, of the system that took the sea in this case by uh, looting and um, sacking etc the same uh, the same native lands um, this is so you know so so evident everywhere this happened also during the Viking era uh, and it's normal uh, every time kind of a you know major power enters in crisis right and so pirates um, of course are there to 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 uh, say exploit at least the situation um, and there is a deep uh, development however occurring within this friction that is to say most of the novel uh, military engineering culture we see also in high medieval times and especially from the European side is something essentially nurtured within very often this broader Islamic sphere of cultural economical and in fact also military influence but very often we're talking about the same view I mean uh, think about the, the first uh, Islamic siege of Constantinople but the Arabs came from the desert uh, they had never seen a ship concretely uh, or, uh, they they were armed uh, essentially the entire navies that they used were exclusively Christian right because the the only um, ports and communities and shipyards that were all in places like Alexandria like in uh, the various uh, Lebanese ports, Tyre, other 
other citizens were imperial and most of their military organization also followed essentially Roman patterns. So um, this, this aspect to me is enormously important because it really and literally opens your eyes on the Mediterranean. It was still fundamentally the center um, of Western Eurasia. And um, let's say understanding that much of Byzantine power as well as this time was deriving in a sense from the projectional capacities of the same empire politically, or not necessarily from a strategical point of view, but in this capacity of still kind of absorbing great part of, of that surrounding and not feeling literally like, you know, a, like a, a, a system close within itself, constantly under siege as, as if, you know, it wasn't actually constantly open and f from which, of course, the, most of the challenges came from, but it was also the only way to, to accomplish anything in the first place. Um, and you see here essentially a Byzantine, um, also novel culture, largely. Um, so the capture of Thessaloniki was, fought in the, which was abandoned, as we've seen also by by the Arabs, because could not be controlled. Like here, there was no capacity of maintaining uh, the stronghold in considering the the the, the, the land mass of, of the empire. Right, it was just hit and run strategy. And it, but it was followed in 909 uh, by uh, a remarkable Byzantine naval success in the Aegean. But three years later, off of the island of, of Chios, the empire suffered a new defeat at the hands of the Arabs that annihilated the imperial fleet. I would like to remind you of the costs of naval warfare that we addressed also in partly in that aforementioned video about the uh, Byzantine naval strategy, not just tactics. Um, these forces were fundamentally um, necessary to support um, land armies, right? And controlling the sea, of course, was equally important in that, in that regard, because if you wanted to carry out important offensives, especially in the great um, Mediterranean coastal centers, you, you needed um, something to counter the enemy naval force as well. So this iron arm was showing, of course, that the, the Saracen force, that here was also relatively centralized, could in fact strike at the heart of the empire and also taking on their fleets in such, in fact, um, a central sea like, like the Aegean that was fundamentally the, the core of of the Byzantine naval uh, world in, in the first place, and also, you know, connecting, in fact, some of the most important areas of the regions of the empire. Um, looking at the Balkan front, also here things did not go well. Um, in fact, there was a new war breaking out with the Bulgarian Empire uh, that uh, was uh, caused by the same Tsar Simen, uh, due to the contrast um, that had um, occurred for the imposition of, of new tolls on the Bulgarian merchants in Byzantine territory. Bulgaria at this point was very powerful, it controlled most of the uh, Balkan interland, um, so every time uh, the empire was in difficulty, the Bulgars took um, Bulgarians at this time, fundamentally in terms of uh, ethnic uh, merging of the uh, original uh, Turco-Iranian conquerors and the majority essentially of Slavic population of pre-existing ethnic substrata. Um, the, um, the chance, in fact, of, of raiding deep in, in the Mediterranean valleys controlled by, by the empire Right, and thus putting pressure on those same markets that uh, the Bulgars, uh, the Bulgarians again, were uh, in fact penetrating at this point. And that's why the Byzantines had also uh, been careful about this commercial penetration because um, making the Bulgarian uh, traders accessing these markets would essentially more directly connect the Bulgarian interland with the Mediterranean traffic. So 
essentially making some of those, those yes, uh, you know, of course, caching through the tolls, and that's uh, that was actually the measure because because there were not really coercive means or other ways, let's say, to, to prevent uh, a normal traffic between the interland and the coastal centers. But still, at least, you know, avoiding the same Bulgaria to become too powerful in the process and to have a too direct, um, in fact, um, access to, to the sea at uh, competing with, with the Byzantine merchants, right? Um, so th this war um, brought, in fact, to Simeon invading the imperial territory and defeating the Byzantine troops. Lady VI, in order to contrast the enemy, recurred to a diplomatic expedient that was uh, had already been used right in Byzantine foreign policy due to the uh, quite turmoilous state of the Western Eur Eurasian steppes, and that it was allying himself with the new um, semi-nomadic people that was knocking at, at the door of, of Europe, that is the Magyars, that at this point were uh, not settled in the, in fact, the Hungarian plain yet, but were just arriving, in fact, in, in the south, in, you know, roughly in today's area of, of Ukraine, and, in fact, finding the, as the first obstacle territorial the same Bulgarian Empire, right? That was not particularly uh, cohesive or close, right? There were there were important, of course, f fortresses exactly in the corridor between the Carpathians and the Black Sea that was also kind of uh, w had been used by the same Bulgars back in the day by entering kind of the the Byzantine area broadly meant, um, and um, and uh, that meant, naturally, here, an entire people, and also a pretty warlike one, because of Ugrofinnic uh, stock, mostly, um, to essentially penetrate um, the, the Balkans and settling, or Central Europe, and settling somewhere. As you know, the thing actually happened, as the Magyars fundamentally took geographically the place of the Avar Khaganate that had been destroyed by the, uh, by the Carolingians and had formed this huge huge frontier area in, on the middle Danube uh, for which also the Bulgarians and from which the Bulgarians had benefited because they reached up to places like um, the same ones that would have been infested eventually by the Magyars later on right up to the middle Danube the border also with Carolingian uh, territory um, the Bulgarians had been pressuring Serbia and etc and as you understand that uh, Constantinople and, and Magyar Alliance at that point meant to catch Bulgaria between two fires. It would would have continued, generally speaking, uh, as long as Bulgaria was around most of the times. So also, when the Magyars settled uh, in Central Europe. Um, in the meanwhile, there was an imperial counteroffensive for which Simeon was obliged to conclude a truce. During which, however, he managed to defeat the Magyars allying himself with the Pachinex, that is a population settled in um, essentially in the east of the uh, of the Magyars at the time and thus essentially playing the same international game that the Byzantines had successfully uh, used to, to stem to hold the Bulgarian onslaught for, for a while. After this in fact uh, the Tsar uh, aggressed again the Byzantines, obtaining in 896 a decisive victory in Bulgarophagon, in Trace. I made a video about the Battle of Bulgarophagon, by the way. After which, the Byzantine government had essentially to give up in signing um, a burdensome peace and to, in fact, pay. A consistent tribute to the traditional Bulgarian enemies. Uh, this sh this shows the unknown politics and war, and uh, this strengthened, by the way, also the the Bulgarian pressure on on the empire overall, so rendering more acute the problems that had already been there. Just think about how much, just in terms of 
of cost, a single battle could shift, right? Considering the, the general delicacy of the states of pre industrial states, and so there are also their uh, resource limits. The internal policy brought, on the contrary, to some important uh, realizations, as we were saying before. Um, the most famous of which was the juridical reform that had already been started by Basil I, telling the truth, and completed by uh, by Leo. Leo had the Basilica drafted in 60 books. This was uh, a legal collection, in fact, in great part, uh, as we said before, a re-elaboration of Justinian as law, right? And it was also the Theodosian one uh, at, at the core. Uh, to which also uh, Leo added numerous novelle, so the additions fundamentally that every emperor could make, the, the novelties literally in the corpus. In fact, it was drafted again on the base of the Theodosian one, but this, this, with this new laws of Justinian that had started the, the trend in that regard. In the, uh, so considering the, the basilica as such, well, they were drafted entirely in Greek, differently from the Corpus Juris Civilis. Thus, they represent um, a remarkable um, innovation in Byzantine legal culture, not just because they were written in a language um, uh, in this language in, in a moment in which the knowledge of Latin in the East had been practically lost, but also because um, they were remarkably more systematic um, books compared to the Corpus Juris of Justinian, right? And, and uh, as a consequence, they became the base of cons uh, of the Byzantine juridical system in the following centuries, and this is also why um, the, uh, the, the the there was a in fact a, a, diff a shift between the recovery of Roman law in the West that was based on Justinian's work and the Byzantine juridical practice that was naturally being transformed considering the, the changes that the empire had underwent, um, etc. And as we've seen also in the West, there was no um, plan to kind of use Roman law in a uh, origin, at least in a, in a broader sense, rather than filling the gaps of, in fact, of a juridical system that had been developing fundamentally on, on its own, but that was um, already and um, mostly beyond the Roman tra tradition. And this, however, uh, must take in consideration that Justinian and uh, society in general was, say, we can't say necessarily more similar to the high medieval Western European one, but at the same time it was somewhat more reminiscent of a previous Roman tradition that um, uh, somewhat fit perhaps better the Western needs in high medieval times, even just as a, essentially as a adaptation, or in, in, at least in the first times in sort of cherry picking. Um, but we will perhaps see better this um, legal history, especially in Constantinople, in another video. Now, in Laos times the relations between state and church as we were hinting at before were troubled by the uh, question of the so-called four marriages that mm, brought uh, in a, a new tension in the empire um, after the end of the iconoclasm that we also discussed in multiple videos. In order to ensure himself a male heir, in fact, Leo VI uh, married four times, right? Um, following continuous widowhoods, so, you know, not really abusing of, of his power in that regard. By the way, his first wife he had been uh, obliged to marry because, uh, but by Basil the first, so there was naturally a lot of political gain behind this um, and uh, this marriage policy, but we will see it now. But in general, it was not really um, an issue that 
had been, you know, that, that Lavrov had been insisting on specifically for some uh, offensive policy over the patriarchate and so on. But this was, however, seen still it was was weaponized uh, against the same emperor because of the opposition that had um, uh, to him that had rallied around the, the legacy of Basil, the hostility that had um, existed um, uh, between the two and the, the, the exile of Fautius and all these things that had definitely posed Leo in a kind of more assertive position, much of his imperial um, power prerogatives. Um, the, the point though is that there was a, a lot of traditionalism in which, um, as we've seen, the Byzantine policy could make leverage. Um, and uh, the fact that Leo had married f four times had caused a great scandal because in Constantinople both the civil and the ecclesiastical law prohibited even the third marriage. Uh, in the, as we've seen, in the first marriage obliged by his father, Leo VI had married at only 16 uh, the uh, Pius Teofano that belonged to a family of the Constantinopolitan aristocracy. And the marriage failed um, due to, um, you know, deep uh, reciprocal incomprehension. Teofano ended up to retreat in a monastery in the Blackerni where she died in 897. Leo VI called to Constantinople then his lover Zoe Zautzina, daughter of his principal political advisor, that was um, Stylian Zautzi, that Basil I had exiled from the city, so also this marriage had a specific uh, political uh, value, and in 898 he he married Zoe um, after the death of her husband. I right? guess she was married. Uh, just she was Leo's mistress. Zoe gave Leo uh, a daughter, but she died in 899, and after a while uh, Leo the sixth married again with uh, Eudosha Baine, who however died, as was sadly frequent, um, of, of, of labor, of birth, uh, in 901, together with the same heir that survived her only a few days, right? Again, the, the mother and the children mortality was dramatically high in those times, even for emperors. Uh, regarding the third marriage, that was, as we've seen, uh, against the Greek church tradition, the emperor had obtained the complicity of what was at the time the Constantinopolitan patriarch, Antony Kaulias. But um, eventually his project to Mary for a fourth time with the lover Zoe Carbonopsina was violently opposed by the new patriarch Nicholas Mysticus. Mysticus derived from the fact that he had been um, uh, an imperial functionary, the Mysticus was the name of it, and he had become patriarch, so also was a kind of a important political figure coming from a civil background before his ecclesiastical career. Now, from Zoe Carbonopsina, in 905, had finally had the male heir, that is, the future emperor Constantine VII. Again, I made a video about him, so you can check that out. And despite um, um, Leo had initially accepted the compromise proposed by the, the patriarch that had offered to baptize the child um, with the condition that um, the, the lover, uh, Zoe, uh, had to be exiled fundamentally, uh, uh, the emperor had decided anyway to have his marriage celebrated 
by a palace priest in order to legitimize the heir to the throne. This was an issue for Constantine eventually that, as you know, was nicknamed Porphyrogenitus because he cared very much about stressing that he was legitimate. Um, and in all, by Porphyrogenitus was really a standard title that basically all, all the, the Byzantine emperors had. And in spite of the uh, raison d'etat that had dictated this choice, the demand to get married for the fourth time posed the sovereign name in a strongly uh, anomalous situation. And at the same time, it went against uh, a principle of good government that had been commonly accepted in Constantinople, according to which the emperor was essentially subject to the laws as much as his uh, own subject, as a matter of fact. Uh, and considering that it was the same law in one of his novella to have prohibited the third marriage and actually disapproving even the second as a general rule. So this was uh, a rem remarkable conflict of, of interest for, however, a generally understandable uh, situation which you can find yourself in. Uh, the Patriarch was pressed by an ecclesiastical faction that opposed the Emperor vigorously, right? And uh, this um, um, represented, if you want, a revolutionary behavior compared to the normal relations between the state and the church in Constantinople. Um, if we consider, in fact, that the Patriarch Kate had remained traditionally mm, obedient to the sovereign's will. Nicholas Mysticus, on the contrary, took this very intransigent position and he publicly uh, showed his hostility to Leo, obliging him when he went to Hagia Sophia in order to, to attend um, uh, to the religious function and with all the court to come back to the palace for two times in a row uh, on uh, Christmas 906 and on the Epiphany of 907. This was an enormous insult and again it, it had never happened practically so uh, it was um, showing in Macedonian times also the resurgence of, of, a, of a Byzantine church with some sort of ambitions and power on her own, but of course still deeply integrated in the broader imperial system, but capable of, in fact, taking such a uh, radical stance. So much so that uh, the solemn procession to Hagia Sophia on the aforementioned days, one of, again, single most important moments in the Palatine ceremonial, uh, so Nicholas Mysticus himself preventing deliberately the, you know, in fact, the, the same ceremony to be um, carried out by putting himself together with his clergy in front of the church and thus prohibiting the access to the emperor. Again, unheard of. Leo VI resolved this crisis that mined his prestige also internationally, aside from just domestically, and in fact the same one of the imperial institution, because here again the universal church, at least as you know, most of, uh, in fact, w what Eastern Christianity thought Constantinople, of like generally speaking, was disconfessing the lay power, and this again in in the Eastern tradition is of dramatic. Um, uh, impact because you see in the West we've been habituated with the excommunications of emperors and they were a big deal at the time but mostly for a political gain that you know could be resolved um, in uh, in uh, that depending on you know the general fluidity of the situation was not the, the same imperial institution was elected there were ways to 
let's say, to, to accept that it was mostly a personal issue. In, in the Byzantine Empire, the church and the state was, were literally the same thing, right? Uh, the emperor was considered as the vicar of Christ on earth, differently from the pope uh, in the West. Uh, and, and so disconfessing this individual meant to disconfess, in a sense, the purity of the entire empire. This was a huge issue. Um, and in fact, the problem was resolved by, uh, by Leo obtaining a dispensation from the West, from Rome, right? That was, generally speaking, more elastic in terms of repeated marriages. Um, and at the same time, more available to oppose herself to the Church of Constantinople. Remember that Leo had taken away um, Falsius, and, and the popes had not forgotten this. And so Rome, naturally, in spite of what Constantinople could, could boast um, uh, in, uh, in practice, was the single most important spiritual uh, power in, in the world and strong of her support Leo deposed uh, by, by a pretext the same Nicholas Mysticus substituting him with the monk Eutemius that was kind of more benevolent towards, uh, towards Leo and that granted uh, in turn a, a dispensation for the fourth marriage. However, the controversy wouldn't end there. Right? This was just the, the moment of greater impasse, it was surpassed, but Leo VI um, suffered of this broader opposition and scandal for some years um, up to the final um, solution in 920 and we have in fact uh, discussed this in the in the other video, you know, after the same Leo's death in Constantine's the, the seven times. But this was a big deal at the time, and it has also important consequences in a broader political sense, even though this is basically the only time the Church of Constantinople ever did such a thing against the emperor, right? For the rest, the Byzantines had managed to properly maintain to keep the church under there was no such thing like you see in the west but this was not a positive thing right because in a broader civilizational sense you always need a provocation you always need an antagonist um, an opposition in order to prove your worth your power right and so this internal dialectic um, of course as we were saying also caused by you know, previous issues um, considering Leo's succession and some kind of lack of, you know, uh, let's say, a respect towards the institution and um, the Patrick. But something, again, that that the emperors were completely habituated. We have seen that emperors put to death patriarchs. Hell, they even tried to put to death popes. So that that's something that really the Byzantines did in an autocratic fashion that um, at the end of the day wouldn't provide the local church with that dramatic spiritual capacity that after all the the western one succeeded in, in impressing in the west in a kind of very sophisticated double thread that still is great part of what western thought is made of um, and that had of course stemmed historically by also the necessities of having fit emperors right so rulers that were kind of spiritually uh, challenging uh, but they had to be up to, to some standards that someone had to concentrate in, in a broader term uh, on and um, we will perhaps talk better about this because um, there is all the broader issue of the of the decadence of the institution over the millennia but also the decadence of the same Byzantine Empire and and with a success of the West that you still have however to explain on the longer run that this exceeds it's a Leo's topic 
And we'll, however, keep talking about him. If anything, we have already seen it that uh, from the Tactica, we we have surely drawn lots of information for many people's warfare that are described at a time. As I was saying before, mostly Leo drove... But we don't even know whether he wrote them or not. It's just, just for the Strategicon as well. Like, these works were written at court in the court in the imperial milieu the emperor may have inspired it and uh, in uh, in in justinian times it may have been composed just you know in a more autonomous way but we're still talking about what essentially the byzantines thought of the past and you realize that there's much that there's a lot of overlapping right in part also because the enemies that the the empire faced were similar like after 300 years it's not a the art of war had changed in any significant way um, to like there are interesting details of course that are you know introduced added here and there there's also reference to armor that is increasing especially for cavalry but perhaps we will see this better uh, in other videos in any case we already made some of them for example the one about the Magyar warfare I think we made something about that or at least the uh, the brothers, you know, Western steps peoples, and um, and this reflects already what like properly the Byzantine world had underwent, right? When you read this strategic and as as for most Justinian and historiography uh, literature, you really um, appreciate the the still the the vivacity. Perhaps that was the moment of of greater synthesis between the Roman um, pragmatism and the and, and Hellenic idealism, right? In a world that was properly still hybrid between Latin and Greek and so on. When you read again this ninth century, early tenth century work, you realize they were just copying the past, right? There is not, there is hardly any innovation to it. It was just already this crystallized view that wouldn't effectively change up to the end. Um, and um, whereas in the 60th century you have there probably some of, of the finest also probably of Byzantine diplomatic skills so not that of course in Leo's times for example this were not developed or that weren't in fact living on the same uh, wake of, of, of the four, uh, of the previous one because you know Constantinople had had to survive in pretty rough times as you know in the, during these centuries in between but at the same time there is no detachment properly from that core model and that kind of classicistic uh, attitude sometimes but also properly the repetition of what was just already written at the time. there's no effort new effort to adapt right there, this is not a civilization that is that manages to put on the table like an entirely different let's say the same degree of uh, insight that the strategic can, could have for, for their times. doesn't matter that the world hadn't changed that much after all, um, and that this was an interesting impression even for how people look at the world um, in pre-industrial times, which is which was very different, right? But again, in the 6th century, that thing had been born out of, out of that reality, ex novo and with a dramatic capacity. Now, there is probably, probably no need even just to it, it, it's kind of easier to rest on the shoulders of those who came before, especially when these shoulders were so massive. But at the same time, there is this kind of gradual lack also of uh, of initiative at the end of the day, and so lack of uh, of a true innovation and the um, the broader issue uh, posed by the. Um, by, by these this events. I should point out it was also in low the six times um, uh, a Rus expedition came to um, harass the suburbs of Constantinople. There is the, the legion that the Rus kind of fixed with a, you know, um, or, or wrote properly their passage on the gates of Constantinople. Th this is one of the first times where the Rus and the Byzantines kind of coming to uh, in, into more direct contact, and they would, um, uh, let's say, eventually always alternate this kind of 
trade and war relations until the Rus were properly Christianized and uh, Byzantinized in many ways. Um, so as I was saying, there is a lot more to tell about Lotus 6, but we'll see it in other videos. For today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And I thank you as always heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.